to start the record of the session. Thanks uh, and the contributors, the presenters, our speakers of today's online panel. So I'm very happy to welcome you in European Distance Learning Week. Uh, organized uh, for the I can see some echoes Some of you who don't speak now can mute your microphone. Thank you. So today we have online panel discussion dedicated to discuss European achievements and innovations and to answer the question why and if we need European Distance uh, Learning Week. This webinar will be recorded and the, the record will be published at the week's website and you can see the link. And most probably you already got uh, information that every day we will have uh, at least one European event. Uh, Tuesday will be dedicated to discuss quality in open online and technology enhanced learning. Wednesday will be dedicated to discuss open education evolving issues like beyond MOOCs. Thursday will be dedicated to validation and recognition of non-formal uh, open learning. And Friday, the digital skills and teaching and learning, are we on the right track? This question will be posed. However, every day we will have the same room for the European Distance and Learning Week. But we have other contributing events. We also participate in USDLA, European United States Distance Learning Association Week. And also we have contributors from Germany and today we will hear more about events and national associations. So this week will be very exciting for all of us. So now let me please uh, uh, focus on today's online panel. My name is Irina. I'm Irina Volingavice, the president of European Distance and E-Learning Network. And we have panel speakers with late apologies. We have some of them who did not, who were not able to join. However, we have the majority joining in, our very special guests and honorary participants. So here you see the list, but I will invite one by one uh, each of you just shortly to present yourself. And uh, I'm happy to invite now to Ladies, and maybe starting with Sharon Goldstein from USDLA. Sharon, please. Good morning. I'm very good morning in the US. It's very uh, exciting to be part of this. Um, I couldn't do this without Marcy Powell, also from USDLA. Um, thank you, Marcy, and thank you, Eden, for inviting us to participate in this very, very exciting inaugural week. I'm, I work at Berkeley College. I'm the campus operating officer for Berkeley's online campus. And I'm also honored to be a board member of the USDLA. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Hello, everyone. I'm Marcy Powell. I'm Chair Emerita and past president of the United States Distance Learning Association. And I currently serve as the chair over our global partnerships, which includes our relationship with Eden, which we're so blessed to have. Uh, I have I serve currently as an educational consultant, and uh, and then work as the volunteer with USDLA and other associations. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Marcy. Now uh, we had excuse from Dennis and uh, Brian, and I would like to ask Brikena to test you. My Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? Yeah, OK. So hello, everyone. I'm Brikena. I'm the director of the Lifelong Learning Platform. Um, I'm, I joined the organization recently in July, uh, but uh, I've been taking this uh, very um, challenged task to represent 40 um, umbrella organizations at European level, where Eden is also one of the members. 
and uh, we promote, of course, lifelong learning in uh, education, and we try to come to bring together uh, different sectors of education, formal, uh, non-formal, and informal education together. And I'm honored to be here, so thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope I can contribute to the discussion. Thanks a lot, Zikana. Yes, hello everybody. I'm also very, very happy and honored to be here. Thank you very much for the invite and the opportunity. Um, I'm a program manager at uh, Hochschulforum Digitalisierung, um, which is a, a government-sponsored uh, German think tank dealing with uh, the well with higher education in the 21st century, basically. So we try to uh, develop uh, solutions, ideas uh, of how uh, universities can uh, well effectively. Um, fulfill their purposes in the 21st century and, of course, uh, all these topics about open learning, online learning, uh, blended learning, all these things are uh, crucial uh, to what we do. We work with a lot of experts, we uh, organize conferences. For instance, on the 1st of December, we have our big final conference for this year. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, there's a uh, lot that we, that we do in this uh, field. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Hello, my name is Alek Tarkowski. I am the director of Centrum Cyfrowe at the Digital Center. We're a Polish think and do tank based in Warsaw. We focus our work on all things open and our particular areas of interest are education, thus our involvement here and, and also heritage and science. And I'm very happy to be able to speak. Thank you, Irina, for the invitation. We consider Eden an important partner. I also work very closely for Creative Commons, where I'm the European Policy Advisor, and this is through Creative Commons that we uh, try to work uh, in Europe on improving open educational policies. And finally, I would like to mention an event I organized this year and will organize again next week, which is the OER Policy Forum, which is a European event that brings together people debating these issues. Thank you very much. And now I'm um, I'm Lisa Marie Blaschka. Hello, everyone. Great to have you here today. Uh, I am uh, on the board of directors for Eden uh, and vice president, uh, and work at the University of Oldenburg um, as a program director for the Master of Distance Education and E-Learning program, um, where I also teach. Uh, and um, yeah. That's at, in the Center of Lifelong Center for Lifelong Learning at the University of Oldenburg, and I'm looking forward to uh, engaging with everyone today. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And our final uh, panel panel speaker uh, is Dean Van Pietigen, who is not able to talk because he is in in another event as well but he will follow us in the chat. Vim uh, is Vice President of Eden and he comes from uh, Catholic University of Leuven. Um, actually, we have participants, 24 participants currently joining in. Uh, we don't have uh, affiliations and, and uh, representations for the majority of them. I can recognize uh, some people, I can recognize uh, students, uh, I can recognize teachers, colleagues, professional mates. Uh, but we are very happy that we find the time and place to meet uh, specifically under this initiative, but I think it's time when we should somehow make, bring synergies, more and more synergies of all that we are doing in our organization so that we can discuss these things uh, online, face-to-face -face, and different opportunities. So today we will go through the five major questions uh, that were announced already on the web for this event. Uh, however, all the participants were invited uh, actually with specific attention to uh, the great contributions that can already be identified on the European landscape on what you are doing uh, as, as the leaders in digitalization, in opening up education and the application of ICT in Europe and behind.
But we have two honorable guests from the US, from the US which is Sharon and Marcy. And actually, the first question that I would like to ask, and I would like to ask now uh, our uh, technical people to move our uh, discussion to discussion format and to allow us to see each other better and uh, to ask participants to post any comments, feedback, questions in the chat option. And we will we'll continue this way. So first of all, I would like to ask Marcy to tell us more about the origins, the history of this initiative that we know from some uh, people in Eden. But Thank you, Irina. So, about 10 years ago, USDLA decided that we really wanted a week dedicated to National Distance Learning Week. In order to do something like that and make it national, you have to get a senator or congressman to back you, and they bring forth a resolution to our Congress, and then the Congress can vote. Fortunately for us, Senator Ted Kennedy uh, from Massachusetts was willing to take it forth for us and we had the week, uh, the second week of, dis of November, declared as our National Distance Learning Week. That first year, uh, I was serving as uh, president-elect for USDLA, and my colleague Reggie uh, Smith, who was also on the board, and then Ken Hartman from Drexel University, partnered together to help design the lineup for the week. And it was a lot of work because it was so new and it was just born. So we reached out uh, to our board members, to our membership, and across the institutions that belong to USDLA. And we were able to come up with a very solid lineup that addressed all of the markets that USDLA represents, which include uh, K-12, our primary secondary education, higher education, government, healthcare, and corporate. And so we were able to reach all of those markets and be able to offer, show how distance learning has really become so mainstream uh, across the United States through all types of associations and organizations, institutions. Uh, through the years, it's grown dramatically to the point that now many of our institutions, uh, and Sharon can share about what they do at Berkeley College and what's on the lineup. Uh, but it's gone across where many, many institutions across uh, the U.S. do their own uh, and sign up with, uh, you can see a list of a lot of the ones that are going on. And those include organizations like Drexel, uh, a Pearson, a company, Pearson, and uh, even NASA. Uh, last year, uh, two years ago, Sharon and I had the blessing of being at the Eden Conference in Barcelona, and we've had a wonderful partnership relationship with Eden. So we brought to uh, the officers of the Eden Board uh, the idea of participating in our National Distance Learning Week as an international partner. And very fortunately, we were able to uh, do that with, with Eden, and we had some wonderful events throughout the week uh, that brought global attention to how greatly distance learning has spread throughout the world. Uh, so then this year, uh, or last year, we were speaking about uh, making, uh, having the development of an Eden, an, well, excuse me, a European Distance Learning Week, which I can't speak to as well as Arena and others that were involved in that. Uh, but we're very excited to see that this collaboration has grown like it has. Exactly, Marcy. I can witness to you that actually European organizations, but also national initiatives, picked up uh, the possibility, you know, to contribute to join with such enthusiasm that it is, it can hardly be, you know, added on. It just goes on its own. So, uh, so thank you very much. We we just mm -hmm. are very happy to transfer this very good idea and initiative that that you uh, established. Sharon, please, maybe maybe you can also share with us. 
Well, this um, started some years ago, and it's really gained quite a bit of tra uh, traction in the U.S., and it's something that we look forward to every year. Um, and we can see with the other national organizations that are focused on distance education, they too have jumped on the bandwagon and really mark um, NDLW as um, an event to be noticed. There are press releases. Um, Berkeley College, where I work, we're very, very involved um, in uh, distance learning. We are very committed to it. And we have a number of events to sort of celebrate and acknowledge this week. One of them being our distance learning symposium, where we invite all our online faculty for a day of professional development. And this year's theme is quality in online education. And quality, of course, has no borders, because I see that that's on your weekly agenda as well. Um, it's, it's something that we're very focused on to make sure that our students are receiving the best possible learning outcomes and learning platforms and experience that they can have. And so we focus a component of NDLW on learning with our faculty, and we also have some fun with it as well. At Berkeley College, we have what we call our Art and Creativity Festival, and it's an online opportunity for our students, staff, and faculty to share their creativity online um, in, in showcasing um, various things such as their sculptures, their paintings, poetry. We have a new category this year, virtual reality, which um, we are really focusing on here at Berkeley and trying to bring that technology into our classrooms, both on site and online. And so we also are working with one of our sponsors, Georama. Uh, they are a virtual pl platform, a video platform company, where they take us around the world with the highest levels of technology and interactive chat capabilities. Uh, Berkeley and Georama have partnered. Georama is also a sponsor of USDLA, and so it all intermingles. And Marcy had mentioned Drexel, and there's other institutions, again, that we all come in and collaborate together. So it's really exciting, and um, you can see on our list of activities the Georama tour of Sorrento, Italy. So they'll be walking us through the lovely streets of Sorrento, and participants will have the opportunity to chat with the um, tour guide, uh, ask questions, and it's an awful lot of fun. We've done this before. So all in all, this is the week we plan for all year. Marcy and I could not be more thrilled when we found out that we got the email from you, Alina, that um, Eden was in fact going to go ahead with a European distance learning week. Um, we're thrilled to be part of it, and we wish you great success uh, this year and the years going forward. We know you'll have it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. It, it was a great experience for us, but now I see that we are, this year we are discussing actually what we would like to see as European Distance Learning Week. Also, we have been discussing a lot the concept, whether it is distance learning, but in Eden we have our preceders, our, you know, gurus who have discussed this concept and actually they come back again to distance learning concept after different, different uh, um, interpretations and, and ideas. And now I would like to invite the one by one other panel speakers inspired by Sharon latest comments maybe to consider what uh, and how would you imagine European Distance Learning Week in terms of uh, innovations in Europe uh, in the area of open distance and e-learning um, um, activities that have been dominating in the last 10 years. Maybe we can cover this aspect in, in the question. And how do you think, how you would envision this week and how you would suggest its development? Sorry, I'm putting the mic on. Uh, okay, so for, of course, for us, 
we don't necessarily focus on distant learning in particular, uh, although we do have a position when it comes to digital learning in general. And uh, what I would say that from our perspective is, of course, to make sure that people have the basic digital skills to access those uh, opportunities. And I think this is a step back before actually we promote distance learning, that we also um, promote uh, the development of basic skills to use those um, technologies and to use these uh, opportunities. So I think it's, it's important uh, for us as well to um, take into consideration this, um, that we provide those, those uh, basic skills um, of using. But also uh, there is another uh, dimension that we believe in, um, uh, in digital learning or distance learning should also focus on, which is the uh, learner centers. Uh, so I think it is important in the development of these tools to take into consideration uh, how this uh, distance learning can actually be more uh, learner-centered than any type of other education or, or uh, other type of uh, learning. So I think this is an added value that the distance learning have, and we we can foster that uh, further. Um, and of course, uh, the self-direction uh, uh, that this type of learning can have. Uh, but however, another uh, barrier that uh, I think it's also important to take into consideration is also the recognition. Uh, how uh, this uh, form of learning is recognized and how it integrates the general curricula. Uh, I think there, uh, there is a lot still to be done, especially in Europe. Um, although we see uh, now developing, uh, this, developing this type of learning more and more, uh, we still have to face some very uh, practical uh, challenges which uh, come with the recognition of this learning and uh, how it's integrated in the general curricula. Uh, so, um, yeah, from our side, it's uh, very much about um, overcoming those barriers. Um, we don't have as such uh, ourselves uh, developed any uh, position on, on in particular when it comes to distance learning, uh, but we uh, try to first overcome those barriers. So um, from our side, that will be a first uh, answer to your question. Um, and I can maybe elaborate uh, further more as we go um, in the discussion if, if the other speakers have maybe a, another point of view uh, from which they tackle this um, form of learning. Thank you very much, Bukena. Uh, let's move maybe now to Germany and Sebastian, how you would see the need for European Distance Learning Week, how you would interpret this context? Well, first and foremost, we have to say that the educational landscapes all over Europe, uh, the, the landscapes are highly diverse. Uh, we have uh, countries with which are very, very government-centered, uh, uh, such as uh, Germany, uh, the Scandinavian countries, where we have, say, more traditional models of uh, at least higher education. Um, and we have other countries which, uh, say, are more innovative and more flexible. Um, so, like, it's, it's really hard to, to really talk about Europe as a whole. Um, I think the first thing is always to look at what challenges do we want to solve. Uh, if we talk about online learning, if we talk about distance learning, uh, the first question, I mean, like, online learning is not an end in itself, obviously. It always uh, solves certain things, and uh, there are, like, a lot of uh, challenges that, that uh, distance learning or that online learning can solve which is, of course, uh, questions of flexibility, uh, geographical, I mean, geographical and, uh, and time flexibility. Um, but uh, they can, in an ideal case, also uh, solve pedagogic questions. And I agree very much with Bukina on that, because you mentioned that as well uh, when we were just talking, that, um, that th these are very central questions. Um, and if you asked about the changes in the last 10 years, I mean, we obviously had the MOOC uh, revolution, or so it was uh, titled at the time, uh, uh, which didn't turn out to be exactly a revolution, which turned out to uh, help some students tremendously, to, uh, that did not help uh, a large majority of students. It did not turn out that MOOCs worked, uh, 
be a model uh, like that could be used in the mainstream uh, for everybody. Um, the reason being that, uh, I mean, in my opinion, the main reason being that the that we cannot just take the pedagogy that we use in, uh, in, in, in uh, well, case to case learning and you transfer it to online learning. It just just doesn't doesn't work. It doesn't motivate uh, people. And uh, so the question is, how do you motivate the people? How do you uh, make up for uh, for the, the lack of seeing someone in person because this has tremendous effects on, on learning as we know. So I think these are uh, these are questions that have, that have been evolving over time and these are questions that are now in, in my opinion like very central to, to the discussion uh, in the field. Thank you very much. It's very very relevant and uh, and of course, the field is very broad. Uh, I would like to ask Alec to focus on the opening up issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, some general comments. First of all, we should all remember, we're all probably aware of it, that the open approach to education, the concept of open education is relatively young. And it can be sort of seen as a younger sibling of, uh, I think, more mature. Uh, movements or approaches with a lot longer history like the concept of distance learning or even e-learning and that has a certain advantage we can see openness as a certain fresh and innovative approach but also I think uh, within open we need to remember that some of the things we're working on have been already approached uh, successfully even by earlier approaches that's one point worth making so we sort of uh, but I think the most important thing that at least is happening in my opinion and from this perspective of open and on which I try to actively work is to see open as very closely related to for instance such approaches as distance learning and I don't think that's always the case. Um, I think uh, open education has its own agenda which is for instance very resource focused and uh, these resource issues are not solved yet. Uh, we're far from solving them. But what I think is becoming more and more clear is that as long as open education stays only at this level of resources, uh, we will not get far in terms of real educational change. In order to be successful, we need to sort of couple these resource issues, which are very significant. They can lead to significant um, uh, cost savings. They can lead to significant increases in effectiveness of education, quality of education, but only if we think about use. And the moment we start to think use, we realize that, for instance, distance learning uh, in the shape of all sorts of online courses is a, is a sort of great space for synergy. Synergy between resources that can maybe be more freely shared, but that are sort of dormant without a good model for using them. So this is something I think uh, we should be focusing in, on, and I'm happy this is a, a nice, for instance, opportunity to show this mixed perspective. Maybe I should take the Thank you very much. I, I, I thought I should maybe say a bit about the situation in Europe, but I can do it in a later comment. Okay, so uh, I would like to Okay, thank you. I would like to to Okay, thank you because there was a phone echo. I still would like to uh, completely explore item two. Alex, do you have the microphone on? No. Okay. Uh, question two, I think, is very relevant. What we mentioned, we mentioned open education evolving, evolving, then the MOOCs. But do we have any other initiatives that we would like to mention here as well? And maybe, Lisa, what is your perspective here? And concept in mind in in regards to what has been mentioned. And yeah, no, I was having trouble getting the microphone on. Apologies. Um, I think what was said already, I think Sebastian's point was, was highly relevant. And when he was talking about the context that we're all dealing with here within Europe, there is not one single context. Um, and so there can't be one single solution for, our distance, for, for distance learning. And so I think something like this, the, the European Distance Learning Week, gives us an opportunity to collaborate and to share. 
uh, and also share best practices and to find opportunities to work together um, on future in initiatives. And um, I also think when I think about how, how things have changed in Europe over the last 10 years, I think one of the biggest things, at least from my perspective here, I'm, I'm also in Germany, uh, is the demographics. And this kind of ties in uh, with a lot of the topics that uh, people have already addressed today um, in, in the opening statements. Um, and that is that we're no longer dealing with students uh, going through the normal channels. That they're just, you know, they're going through grade school, high school, and then university. Uh, but we're really looking at lifelong learner, lifelong learning. And I think the the coming together of a number of events, uh, the advancement of technology, uh, the the um, the need for new pedagogies. I think all of those things um, have erupted or have uh, become important because of the fact that our demographics and the needs of our learners are changing. And so um, I think, uh, you know, what was also mentioned, you know, Burkana had, had mentioned the need for new pedagogies. We need to find new ways to address uh, teaching and learning uh, for the new technologies and for, uh, to address the needs of the, of the learners of different demographics. Um, and I think uh, all of the topics that we've discussed here um, are, are really relevant uh, to, um, to doing that, as, uh, part in particular the open education movement. So I see this week, um, and, and not just this week, but uh, other, you know, in, in the future, opportunities for us to work together, to collaborate, share our experiences, uh, and also to share, you know, our best practices so that we can um, really find solutions to some of these problems. Thank you, Lisa. I try to put the notes, and uh, I know that presenters uh, have the right for note taking. However, participants don't, so please don't hesitate to use chat option to post any feedback, any comments, ideas here. Don't be passive, be active. And I see that actually them uh, posted in the chat coming from a traditional university. I would like to bring in the notion of blended learning in the discussion. Uh, thank you, thank you, Vema. We will uh, maybe elaborate on this uh, also with the with the next item. Uh, if you also have some insights that would be important, please um, put them in the chat as well. So now maybe we can move on and try to focus on two things. One thing: what actually strengths or positive experiences you would be willing to mention. I would invite both from the US and from Europe in the area of open uh, distance and e-learning. So what went right? And then we will focus on what needs to be improved. Okay, so let's do a round again. And what would you like to mention? I would be glad to, Irina. Uh, so much comes to mind because distance learning and blended learning them have grown so tremendously throughout the world. And when I look at the innovative things that are happening, all the technologies that are being integrated, Lisa Marie, as you said, and the new pedagogies and the different approaches uh, for teaching and learning. Uh, when you look at holography, augmented reality, virtual reality, gamification. University of Limerick, for example, has a really neat game that they've designed in teaching prediction markets. So when you look at the unique way of uh, approaching, taking all the technologies that are highly innovative and very engaging for all students, uh, I, I'm very impressed with some of the things that are going on across the U.S. and across Europe um, throughout the world. Um, I love what University of Hull is doing with uh, Minecraft and figuring out how that can help teach mathematics to uh, primary secondary students in very engaging ways. So using what students love and then using it to really grow what they're going to do. Um, when it comes to MOOCs, I would say that MOOCs are still 
uh, very strong in the U.S. I, I see them very strong in Europe when I look at FutureLearn and what they've done at, with their platform and who's joining. Uh, I find it interesting, one of our colleagues, Arena, um, Deborah, um, senior moment, last name, uh, from University of Burgundy, when they did their MOOC on uh, going from grape to glass in the uh, learning of how to make wine, uh, one person socially tweeted it on, on social media, tweeted it to Wine Spe Spectators, which is a U.S. magazine, very famous magazine, and they immediately had over 25,000 people sign up for the MOOC. Uh, I thought that was an interesting way of really showing what we can do. And what I've seen with MOOCs that are happening, like you look at Georgia Tech, and I'll close with this one because I know others have things to share. Um, Georgia Tech took the MOOC style and they did a very innovative approach by saying, let's offer computer science, a master's in computer science, for only $6,000, which is unheard of in the United States. That would be a 25,000 plus uh, degree. And they offered it worldwide. Um, some of their very first graduates were from China and other places. And uh, they found a way, for the, the learners found a way to engage and to wait, form their own collaborative groups and their own face-to-face. -face. Uh, they used video for the instructors and then made sure the instructors that they had access. But the concept was how can we increase uh, and make this uh, more accessible and that's a point we haven't talked about yet is accessibility and how important that plays a role. So they made this degree plan more accessible and they have had over 8,000 people enroll in the program, something they could not have done with their bricks and mortar institution to manage that many students wanting to get that degree. And so I'll leave it with that on the, some of the innovative ways we have approaching distance learning throughout the world. Thank you very much, Marcy. It's, it's, it's very interesting. We, we always wonder, you know, these um, kicks-offs and, and um, I think the concept um, of predictability um, is really valid. I know here at Berkeley, um, we have adopted some software that actually gives us some predictive analytics. Uh, with our students. We just implemented that within the past actually two, three weeks. So I'm still involved in, in learning it. In fact, right after this webinar today, I have a train, another training session on it. But we're really excited because it's giving us really good information as we look at the students learning online and where they're focusing and what their um, success predictors and so forth are so that we can develop initiatives to really target those students. And to the issue of blended learning, um, through the predictive ana analytics, we have found that our students um, have the highest degrees of completion uh, when they are blended, um, rather than all online or all on site. And so we're, we're, we're working toward this because this is something that we just cannot um, ignore. Uh, also, the idea of adaptive learning um, and learning at the student's own, own pace um, and um, style is really important again to the success of the online learner and no longer can the model um, be sustainable where everybody learns exactly the same way especially online um, we are now we've now moved to um, no more textbooks and we do all ebooks um, platforms with our publishers and so forth and the technology that they are building into that interactiveness is really wonderful and lends to wonderful learning opportunities. Um, as you know, there's probably not a week that goes by that some vendor or some publisher or some innovator isn't coming up with a new, a new method, and it's just very exciting to try to keep up with it, knowing that you know the future is just so positive, and you know it's it's just not standing up and lecturing and and um, 
and see the results and really excited to keep uh, exploring these options. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, now let's uh, move to European experience. And I would like to ask now each of you to, to, to get feedback on what you see as the best experience, something positive, what happened? Well, thank you very much. Um, what well, to be fair, um, I think that Germany is not exactly on the forefront when it comes to uh, innovative uh, distance and online learning, uh, well, use of technologies there. Um, there's a lot happening right now. We have the situation where the political will to invest significant amount of, amount of money uh, into this issue is uh, forming quite rapidly right now. So I think we'll see a lot of change there. But um, to be fair, when I was, uh, was south a year ago, I was in Ireland for a few weeks and I visited some universities there, uh, Galway, uh, several Dublin universities, and I was impressed, I was actually blown away by what they're doing as compared to what we do. Um, so uh, when it comes to, to, uh, to what, what happened positively, I mean, well, in, in Germany, within the last 10 years, we doubled the amount of people who uh, do uh, distance learning, learning courses at universities. This uh, so obviously something went well there. Uh, you don't double the numbers if, if there's not, not not something positive happening. Um, but to be fair, I'm I'm, I'm sure that actually uh, uh, Alec and Brickenna will be uh, uh, will be more able to actually to actually talk about uh, very positive uh, examples. I, I would say in Germany there are. Clearly positive examples. There are some universities that uh, use, uh, make very creative use of, of the new possibilities of technology. Those can be bigger universities such as Aachen, uh, which is uh, the most prestigious uh, engineering school in Germany, uh, who do amazing things, amazing blended learning, uh, amazing use of blended learning technology. Some smaller universities that outside Germany nobody has ever heard of, which is like uh, uh, University of Applied Science, uh, Lübeck, which is uh, really unknown outside Germany, that does amazing stuff. Oldenburg, uh, obviously, uh, is on the forefront when it comes to uh, to online learning. Um, but I think, as a whole, uh, there are other countries that make much better use in general. I would say that we're slowly starting to see some of them happen, but uh, not enough. And probably the challenges, as already has been mentioned, for instance, by Sebastian, is sort of the natural uh, decentralization and distribution in Europe. You know, we have many languages, we have many educational systems, both in higher education and in, in primary and secondary. And, and this leads all to um, challenges, and I think that is the reason we don't yet see such impressive uh, growth of open models as we now see in the US, for instance, in the college space. We can only dream of such success. We've had in the last several years some success with sort of basic policy shaping. So certainly an important move was uh, the opening up uh, open education, opening up education uh, communication by the commission, which set some groundwork for seeing this as an important issue. And probably the most important practical development that came out of it is that the IPTS, the Institute for Prospective Technological Studies in Seville, which is part of the Joint Research Center of the Commission, has been conducting quite significant sort of um, research and also policy work on open education. And an interesting recent, I think, very important development was the uh, development of the open educational framework which is sort of a framework that can be used by higher education institutions to sort of define the role of open education models and tools within broader educational strategy. And hopefully this will lead us to more of a mainstreaming of this approach, because for now I think open education in higher ed, and it's quite the same in, in primary and secondary as sort of results of actions of single um, universities. We don't see, for instance, and, and this I would like to see more developments around 
some sort of repositories. It's, it's a bit curious. We have very strong open access repository models. One would think it would be relatively easy to build on them in higher education even more easily than at school level, but we're not seeing this yet. So I would say we're, we're doing quite good with the policy. I should also mention that the Erasmus Plus program, the really big funding program, has an open um, licensing requirement. Again, it could be a bit stronger, but it's a good step forward. So the policies are slowly being uh, in place. Now we should just focus on implementation. And I think um, organizations and networks like Eden have here a really big role they can play. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Brikena, uh, from perspective of lifelong learning, do you have any positive comment how actually all that? Uh, yeah, I will try to mention some of the positive, of course, initiatives. Generally, I just want to add to the discussion on how how is uh, the situation in Europe, uh, how it looks like. Uh, of course, we see, as, as was, was said before, uh, we are still uh, developing uh, the actual implementation uh, of it, but uh, there is a geographical um, discrepancy. So you have uh, Western um, countries where universities, prestigious universities, and also private universities have been developing those tools very successfully. Successfully, and on the other side, we have Eastern and Southern Europeans that are still struggling with it. So we have a we have a discrepancy in in that development in Europe. However, what I wanted to maybe um, add as well as a positive feedback, of course, the fact that Lisa said before that distance learning or generally the uh, online learning has opened up to opportunities for lifelong learning. Uh, so more people for at any age, at any moment of their life, can actually access those uh, type of learnings and that's a very important development and it is it's a major contribution to the lifelong learning uh, ap approach and also of course it enables the learners to adapt their their speed of learning and, and their path so this is also a very positive uh, thing uh, another thing that uh, maybe Alec mentioned the Erasmus program is also um, supporting a lot uh, these developments and in particular I will mention the virtual mobility uh, program and the financing that are going to be given next year uh, to develop the virtual mobility in Europe, which has also, of course, been one of the focus of the European Union to um, access uh, uh, mobility opportunities, not only offline, as we have experienced a lot of uh, Erasmus, or a lot of students going abroad, a lot of uh, young people going abroad for learning experience. Now, uh, also this uh, distance learning and, and, and online learning has been used also to have this virtual mobility for those that cannot afford to travel abroad, cannot afford to stay abroad, uh, so they are experiencing a, a kind of international experience, uh, staying at home and, and learning through those uh, online classes. So I think that's a very positive um, development, uh, which I think we, we, I mean, we are supporting and, and, and I, I think uh, many of the, the providers or many of the universities are also uh, trying to promote this more um, because we, of course, live in, in a very globalized and in, interconnected world. So uh, international international uh, openness and international skills are very, very much needed. Uh, so there their way it comes with distance learning that uh, it has it, its place, it has its value. Uh, so of course there are very positive uh, developments. Uh, also of course the, the access in general has improved. Um, to people in maybe more remote areas, I would say. Uh, of course, um, as I said before, we are far away from having that uh, uh, having solved the accessibility issue to people with disabilities or people that um, actually are in very deep remote areas where uh, they barely have connection to internet and barely have connection or even devices to be able to uh, access those, those learning opportunities. But I mean, 
certainly I can say that there are some positive developments. Uh, most of our members from the different uh, sectors of education are using those uh, opportunities also for their staff trainings, uh, for volunteer trainings, uh, which is in, 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 in quite an amazing positive uh, development as well, how actually this uh, old uh, fashion uh, e-learning uh, now developed more are used for volunteers to develop their skills while they do their um, they experience in an association or in a, in a different uh, civil society organization. So there are many, many different uh, ways the different uh, organizations are using uh, these tools uh, to develop skills of any type type of a learner, uh, not only those that are uh, within the, the formal education um, path. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I agree with Alec a lot in terms of policy has been put on the table, uh, has been shared and has been uh, politicians has committed to develop it further, but uh, we have to uh, take care of the implementation and make sure it are implemented in the way we want and that we ensure that democratic uh, accessibility to, to, to those tools. Um, so yeah, I mean this I, will be some of the um, positive um, feedback I will share at the moment. Um, Thank you very much, Brukan. I think we have a very nice. Uh, uh. Um, it's always fun being at the end of the uh, of the line of questioning because everyone else has already identified all of the challenges and all of the best practices. So. I just would like to touch on what um, the other panelists have, have brought up. Um, Marcy and um, Sharon both talked about technology and the role of MOOCs. And within Europe, I, I think Future Learn, Open Learn, what the OEU UK is doing is, is really exciting stuff. Um, there's uh, so many changes uh, as the new distance, uh, as, as distance teaching universities try to reinvent themselves um, for the, the new environments that they find themselves in. Um, and I think that, again, I, I can't mention enough the context that we're in within Europe. I mean, each of us, um, each of the panelists here from Europe have been speaking about their individual context. They've been talking about uh, the different issues that they're confronted with, you know, whether there's bandwidth, whether there's support for, for change and innovation uh, within uh, the school systems. I think those, uh, the context really needs to be um, thought about, um, and uh, and again, I think through events like this, where we can collaborate, share experiences, uh, there's opportunities for us to 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 really um, make some progress. Um, because Sebastian brought up uh, University of Oldenburg, I'm going to mention it. Um, uh, as an American in 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 Europe, I have to say I would I would agree with the assessment that we're not as um, I don't want to say as far as the United States, uh, but we, we're more hesitant, I think, here in Europe. Um, and, and we don't jump on the first bandwagon that comes along. Not that the Americans do that. I don't want to say that. Uh, but, <laughs> but we are a bit more cautious, especially when it comes to education. Uh, and so I think um, the approaches are a little bit different in, in that sense. Um, and I also think, uh, from, from our perspective, uh, from the University of Oldenburg, um, we offer a solution um, that, that uses the blended learning, like Sharon was talking about earlier, uh, and has been very successful um, for, our, for our university, at least within the Center for Lifelong Learning. Um, and that is uh, providing really a, a really basic, fundamental um, online system for students, working students to use. Uh, and then to have face-to-face -face workshops at inter intermittent uh, points within the semester. Uh, we've gotten really positive feedback. There's some, been some great research that has emerged from it uh, from our students. Um, so really, um, I, I just I know I'm emphasizing this again and again, but, but context really defines, uh, defines Europe and the solutions that we choose and the solutions that we, um, that we, uh, that we design.
Thank you very much, Liz. I think, uh, well, last week I, I was in India and UNESCO uh, ICT forum, and uh, in comparison to other regions uh, of the world, especially those uh, Far East and also uh, South Africa and, and other, like uh, Saudi Arabia and others, I would say we are really strong in Europe in terms of, let's say, internet permeability into infrastructure connections. Uh, as, as it was correctly mentioned in policy development as well, what actually we uh, we will or we might be over uh, overspeeded very soon is in in best practices when people solve the problems when they apply technology whenever problem exists to solve it and mainstream it. So I think for our uh, economy development and for our market development, it's very important that everyone understands how important actually is uh, to recognize this achievement. And with the comment coming from Francisco Perez Lozano from Universidad de Barcelona, I, I would go further on because it also raises challenges. And uh, as uh, Francisco says, it's very important to match teaching with research to encourage teachers to make good practices the lack of recognition of teachers compared to research hinders, the development of the introduction of best practices in traditional universities. To me, it sounds like a warning, but from the heart. So actually, uh, talking about the innovations, we need to mention the, the challenges and uh, also some something that would lead us to the maybe biggest mistakes if we don't implement one or another policy in the right place and in the right time. And uh, if quickly we would go around and mention the challenges, something that must be uh, immediately implied and solved, you know, priority order. What? <laughs> okay, I was I was waiting to talk at the end, so. <laughs> um, what do I see as, as major challenges? Well, I think, uh, Again, the, the context, I mean, how are we going to find solutions? Um, can we find solutions? Can we learn from each other? Are there opportunities for us to learn from each other, uh, to learn from our experiences? Um, I think a big challenge is, 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 is just getting the support that we need uh, to, to realize the many, um, the many ventures that, we, that we're implementing. Um, you know, support at different levels, at the institutional level, uh, within our within our institutions, uh, support at the policy level, and I'm sure that that Alec can speak more to this. Um, to to really make these changes happen um, is is a is a big challenge, um, and and as I mentioned before, because of the context that we're in, each country has, and even within countries, each country has different challenges uh, that they need to need to address. So I think. For us in Europe, that will be uh, our major challenge: is, is how do we address these different contexts, and how do we find solutions that will meet the needs of our learners? Thank you, Lisa. I will read just Matthias' comment in the in the chat. I guess before we start to talk about implementation of new technology and e-learning formats, we have to think about what is necessary in the future. So we will go to future questions in a moment. Sorry, I was just turning on my mic. I hope you can hear me. Uh, so actually, um, the obvious step would be to work more on European policy, but I think that's a kind of boring answer. So. A more interesting one, and I think fits well with, with priorities in, in Europe right now, would be to work more on teacher training. We identified this in Poland, doing a quite extensive uh, sort of evaluation of the situation in open education uh, as a crucial issue. And this is also this attempt to, to look more broadly. You know, and we almost sometimes feel would like to call it open and digital education or something like that. This is still a narrow field when you look at education as such. Still, many people don't get it. So. Uh, of course, we can say there are a lot of challenges with infrastructure, with policy, but it seems that at the lowest level, which is the crucial one, we're still at an issue of awareness raising and an understanding of basic 
uh, issues. At the same time, um, such work can be very successfully run and not very heavily um, advertised open MOOC course for academics. And we had um, 300 people participating with around 60% retention rate. It, it's a really amazing result, uh, which shows also that if you translate it well into practical skills, uh, and educators really want to learn these things around copyright, around sharing resources, around finding resources. So I would focus on that. And, and I think the EU is focusing a lot on digital skills, so this fits very well into the agenda. Um, like me, or uh, because it was so loud, I couldn't hear. I, I would ask you to was comment. And... Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, th th thank you very much. Um, I would like to pick up what uh, Francisco uh, said in the chat. Um, I think that um, using digital tools in higher education well is mainly a question of good teaching. So this really lies at the core of it. Um, and um, the question of having a uh, too low recognition um, of, uh, of teaching at universities, this is clearly an issue in many European countries, including Germany. I was uh, very positively surprised when I was in Galway and they told me that uh, at least um, on paper they uh, value at Galway University um, teaching and uh, research are the same way that they're equal. Like in fact, they're not really equal, but at least on paper. In Germany, they're not even equal on paper. And um, I, I think that these are attitudes that you cannot change quickly, but they need to be changed. And how can you change them? You change them by, uh, for instance, putting more uh, resources into teaching. and. Um, this could be uh, with uh, much better support units, teaching support units uh, at universities uh, that uh, support uh, professors um, in making good use of technology in education or just also just training them of how to you know, do more, say, constructive, active uh, learning uh, with their students. Um, it's about... Um, how people get paid. It's uh, to a large degree about, um, uh, at least in Germany, about how much money uh, they can uh, uh, get from uh, for their research. Um, so their pay is to, to quite some degree linked to that. Um, if we, uh, at least to some degree, uh, uh, linked uh, uh, pay for professors more to their teaching, that would also help a lot. So it's about it's, these, these are changes that will come slowly, but I think they are crucial to um, have more and better um, online distance, but also just on campus learning, better use of blended learning, for instance. I mean, this is blended learning is uh, happening to a large degree uh, for, for, for uh, on-campus students uh, as well. So um, I think it's really about recognition and putting more money into that and, uh, and creating more uh, uh, units to help professors. Yeah, it, it's difficult to pick one, but uh, I think um, what I said at the very beginning that um, these basic skills of uh, knowing how to use those tools is necessary. Just to give you like one personal experience, when I was a student uh, many years ago, we tried to do a virtual class with people in different countries in Europe. I was based in France and um, we used Facebook as a tool to communicate and to, to share all the materials of the course. And at the time, uh, Facebook was just 
about to, it was just the beginning in Europe and a lot of us didn't know how to use it and a lot of us uh, mixed up what was private and what was educational and it was, uh, at the end, it was a very challenging experience. We learned a lot, of course, but we also uh, messed up a lot in a way. So um, th that's to say that I think it's very important to uh, teach first basic uh, necessary skills on how to use those tools and how to make, to make the best use, uh, bearing in mind all the, the, the consequences it might have, the responsibilities, uh, but also like uh, accessibility issues. Uh, but if I have to pick one, uh, an, another big think that we should tackle at um, this issue is especially major for teachers. Uh, I really like the comment of one of the uh, participants, uh, I think Ma Matthias uh, Bartel, that says about how can we actually teach uh, t uh, kids about uh, some skills uh, about the future that we don't even know ourselves, how it would look like. And I totally agree. Uh, but in the short term, the problem we have to face is actually uh, teach the teachers that were uh, got out of an old-fashioned system and then they didn't have those um, uh, those, those uh, possibilities to actually learn basic skills uh, and, and to learn this how to use these technologies. So in the short term, we have to first train the teachers. And I think that's very important because they play a crucial role. Even in what I said before, teachers play a crucial role in, in, in uh, raising awareness and informing the, the kids about how to use those tools. But first of all, they are there themselves, they need how to use it and make the best use out, uh, out of them. Not only to, to use it to change their, um, their teaching methods, but for themselves, to train themselves, to actually develop their skills. Uh, and get trained regularly because their skills need to be uh, developed very regularly and in a very fast way, more than it used to be before. So they need to access those tools as an opportunity for them to quite quickly uh, develop their skills and, and, and train themselves and develop their, uh, their competences. So uh, yeah, for me it's very important that we tackle this, uh, this problem of teachers uh, training and teachers uh, using the, uh, these uh, possibilities for both. One, to change the teaching and the learning experience, but also for themselves to train themselves and develop themselves. So that will be my one if I have to pick one. Thank you, Brickenna. I know that Alec needs to leave in scale, a moment. Um, I would work to, to strengthen this legacy of a European policy that already includes an open education component and really take that seriously because I see, at least for instance, in terms of policy debate, this interest decrease a bit after two, three strong years. At a very practical level, one thing I can suggest in building on this in Poland, recently teachers at school level organized a fascinating all day webinar, which was a huge success. They just, you know, some of people get excited by ideas like 12 hours of learning, which sounds a bit surprising, but they had over a thousand people participating constantly. So um, maybe a week is the nice format, but in our modern times, everything needs to be quicker, bigger, faster. So maybe at some point we should do just like a 24 hour global webinar with people around the world pitching with uh, really fresh things they are doing. And that would be my suggestion. And, and as I, you know, I mentioned, I unfortunately have to leave now for another meeting. So thank you once again for the invitation. And goodbye. Thank you very much, Alec. Thank you very much. Uh, so now I think we have the final round with a final question that I already asked Alec. What, what would you see as the future of open distance and online learning? What would you, what would you see as, as your vision and uh, uh, what leaders would you see?
on European level, maybe the US, maybe global level, because uh, uh, Marcy and Sean can also say uh, what is what is their point of view. But uh, let's leave this uh, question yeah, I would open. be glad to. I think the future is very exciting. Uh, I believe that technologies have arrived and are continuing to be developed. When you look at learning analytics and the affordability of adaptive learning, and the ways that these technologies are going to allow us to meet the student where their needs lie. And the fact that it will be like a smorgasbord, or I've heard someone uh, say a panorama of learning uh, that's available for virtual students. And so it's exciting to me to see that distance learning and open learning has come to the point of mainstream. We've been, many of us on this call, have been working towards this for 20 plus years and longer. The USDLA will celebrate its 30th anniversary next year. And so I was having a conversation just um, yesterday or day before, day before yesterday with a young man who is nearly 30. And he's born since the USDLA was born. And to listen to him talk about how technologies have come about and how he's using them now as he teaches was really exciting. And so I think that I, the technologies have arrived, the capabilities have arrived. Um, I highly agree with everyone's comments towards teacher training, and I hope to see that our governments, uh, the European Commission and, and others, the EU, US, all of us will fund towards that uh, more intense uh, teacher training. Because in, as all of us know, we don't know what we don't know. And some are scared to ask when they say, I've heard of VR, but what does that mean in teaching? Um, and so to make those available is very exciting. So I think the future is going to be a smorgasbord or panorama of learning. Uh, the adaptive learning technologies and the artificial intelligence will allow us to take whatever course we want when we want it. I think we'll continue to see a, a dramatic growth in competency-based learning and the recognition of that with companies who uh, will say, I accept this um, badge, this uh, certificate, uh, all of these different modalities we have to show that they are competent and what needed to be learned for that job. So it's exciting. I think we're going mainstream on steroids. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Arena. Um, I'm actually not a teacher. I'm the campus operating officer for the college, so I oversee the administrative, mostly the administrative and operational end and working with, with all parts to make it a whole. Um, but I, uh, to Marcy's point, um, we have um, emerging technologies, and at Berkeley we are really committed to trying different ideas that we feel will enhance learning. And what we found are um, two things. I'm going to echo what everyone has said. Teacher training is so critical because we can have the most wonderful technologies, but if the faculty are really not adept at using these, then in fact what's supposed to be a help is actually a hindrance in the classroom. And so it is imperative that they be trained. And the other side of that coin is that the faculty want, they have to want to be trained have to want to embrace it. And as our program grows, um, we want to make sure that we maintain the quality of our program by utilizing faculty who will embrace this and aren't excited to embrace it. And I'll say at Berkeley, we, ha we develop um, creative ways for our online students to access information, be it in the classroom or co-curricular co activities. We have a whole plethora of ways that we engage our students outside of the classroom using technology. And what we found, we've done it by necessity for our online students. And our other campus locations, of which there are eight, 
have really jumped on and adopted some of those technologies for their on-site students. Um, as, as Lisa had, had commented earlier, we're talking about non-traditional students. And even those who attend on-site um, are not the traditional model. And they're there, and they go to their class, and they leave. And so for us to be able to offer our co-curricular programming through these different technologies and platforms and provide our students a means to interact with us outside of the classroom is beneficial not only for our population of online students, but all of Berkeley College at all locations. And I would say, you know, that's true in learning across the U.S. and, and, and Europe as well. Um, you know, learning goes way beyond the classroom. And it's just so exciting. And that's why I love what I do. Uh, no two days are the same. There's something new around the corner. And for those not afraid of change who embrace change, we're all in the right place right now. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Marcy and Sharon uh, said a lot of things that, uh, that I completely agree with as well. I think um, when we look at the future, obviously higher education or education itself is always evolving. There's not one future, it's always a process, there's always new things happening, new needs coming. Um, However, I think that I, I completely agree with Marcy when you say that um, uh, the, the landscape is going to be more multidimensional, uh, multidimensional in the form of education providers on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, uh, when it comes to uh, the kinds of degrees, uh, I think that uh, when you mentioned badges, I completely agree with that. We will have, uh, we will see more micro degrees. We will see. Uh, say a more richer landscape. I do not see that uh, the traditional degrees are going to disappear, like bachelor, master, PhD. Uh, however, we'll, we'll have a, a more diverse and more rich landscape. Um, and I think that, um, especially when it comes to to uh, big international companies, uh, we we already see it. Have we already see it that they uh, recognize non-traditional degrees more and more. So multidimensional would be the first thing. The second thing is accessibility uh, and openness, uh, which is uh, which I think are in the process of uh, drastically increasing um, by uh, catering more to non-traditional students. Sharon, you mentioned that um, this is happening. Universities have more and more non-traditional students. Uh, they need to cater to them uh, with uh, the digital uh, uh, revolution. We have the tools to 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 uh, to provide education to them. And I think this is a process that, that we are seeing right now and the process that will absolutely uh, continue. And the third thing, I think the third uh, thing that we will see more in the future and which is already happening now is to have a more student-centered education. This has a lot to do with uh, pedagogy. I think uh, that, uh, that the whole question of digital raises the question of good pedagogy uh, another time. And I'm using the word all the time because it's really German to say pedagogy. Uh, I know that the word also uh, works in English, but this is really uh, the German perspective I'm bringing in here, um, just this word. And um, so I think this is the third thing that we'll see, uh, that we have um, more student-focused, um, more like more interactive, uh, more constructive. Uh, Thank you, Sebastian, very much. Yeah, it's very difficult because uh, I have to say Sebastian very well summarized everything and mentioned all uh, of my points. <laughs> so well done. Um, so I, I don't have that much to add to it apart from saying that I agree that the future looks very exciting but also scary in a way uh, because uh, there is a lot of work uh, to be done from all of us and uh, to make sure that uh, this development uh, develops 
steps in the right way. Uh, and, and I'm very curious, and, and I think all our organizations are very curious to see how the, this, uh, this uh, distance learning will actually revolutionize education, uh, but especially if, if will, it will have any influence in inclusive education, in making education more inclusive. So that's my uh, one of the points. I'm, I'm very curious about the future, uh, and, and we will work for the next year on it. Uh, we will try to uh, come up with uh, some work on, on the topic and, uh, and see uh, how actually uh, this uh, type of uh, learning uh, can make education more inclusive, as this will be also the focus of the 2017 agenda on the EU level, and uh, digitalization being at the same time uh, on, the, on the table. Uh, I think combine this, uh, these two, it will be very interesting to see how uh, this will actually get together. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the future, um, it's unpredictable. Um, we need to cooperate, and I think one of the things that we have observed with this uh, uh, learning is that um, there has been more partnerships, diverse partnerships of different stakeholders. Uh, while the formal and the traditional education was only institutional, institutional based, this uh, type of uh, online education, online learning has developed uh, a very diverse type of partnerships. And I'm very curious to also see in the future how this type of partnerships will contribute to, a, to, the, to the learning experience even more. So bringing new actors into the, uh, into the learning is also a very interesting thing to, 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 yeah, to bear in mind. Uh, so yeah, that will be all, and I really thank you, uh, Eden, for uh, organizing this week because I think it's very important to reflect and to raise awareness, and, and I think this type of uh, events are very useful. Uh, thank you, thank you, Brikana. I think uh, what I put, uh, and maybe you agree with me, I put uh, uh, the term value-based solutions because I heard some voice from you that we should be very accurate and actually think why. And I think we're confronted by a number of developments, all of which have been brought up by the panelists today. Uh, MOOCs, open education, personal learning environments. These are these are no, new technologies. These are these are events that are that are affecting not just teaching. They're affecting uh, they're affecting us at all different levels: the micro, the meso, the macro levels. Um, and in order for us to navigate uh, these new environments, we are or the future for that matter, we're going to need leadership that is strong enough uh, and is um, open enough. Uh, to guide us uh, uh, through this um, through this path because it's not clear and you've got you know what Matthias mentioned uh, in the in the comments um, teach you've got teachers that that are not in 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 favor of this any time type, type of change is difficult uh, it's challenging uh, also for organizations such as ed, uh, for education just in general for policymakers. Uh, and I think strong leadership will be absolutely necessary in order for us to, to realize the types of change that has been discussed here. Um, I think the, the role of Eden um, in, in that landscape, uh, you know, the work that we're doing on the projects in helping to form policy I think is important, but also the international collaborations such as the one, uh, the one with USDLA uh, that had created this, uh, this uh, European distance learning, um, European distance learning week, I'm switching it with the National Distance Learning Week. Uh, but I think there's lots of opportunities there, but really we need to have leadership that is going to be supportive of these new pedagogies that are that is going to be open to this change uh, and because there's there is so much change occurring. So we'll need leaders that will be able to to help us navigate through that uh, through the new environment. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Lisa. I know Brickenna wants to say goodbye, and we all say goodbye in a moment, but she needs to rush immediately. So I would like to thank her. Thank you very much, Brickenna. And if we go back now to our um, uh, presentation mode, I, I ask technical people to get back to presentation mode. And uh, I would like to say thank you, big thank you to each of you once again, to uh, Sharon and Marcy joining us uh, at, I guess, 5 in the morning or 6 in the morning from the US uh, for all the experience, for professionalism and transfer of your best practices to Europe in terms of national distance learning. We, we will try in the future to keep it up synchronously with you so that we have contributions to each, each other's initiatives and, and make it global. Uh, I also would like to thank Sebastian a lot uh, for bringing German perspective. Uh, I, I know that uh, it is very important to discuss other areas, but your uh, perspective was very important. I know Alec and Brickena left quickly, but participated as long as possible. Of course, even people, uh, Lisa and Wim as well, but also participants uh, who contributed actively in the chat, especially, uh, I would mention Matthias, we had uh, just a moment, Francisco, and then Liz and others who posted their comments. They're very valuable insights. And uh, I just would uh, briefly mention that tomorrow, at the same time, we will have the next webinar at the European Distance and E-Learning Week. Other contributors are mentioned also at the website. Tomorrow we will have quality discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And if I might may just make some advertising, um, like right now, I also put it in the chat, there's a discussion going on co-organized by Hochschulforum Digitalisierung by our think tank on uh, uh, digital higher education in the EU. I posted the link if you want to join in. Uh, it's uh, going to be 